In algebra, we spent a lot of time finding the slope of a line. We always needed two points because the formula for slope is rise over run. But what if you only have one point? How do you find the slope of a curve at a single exact instant? It seems impossible with our old tools, but this one question is the key that unlocks calculus. We're gonna build the answer from its core idea, master the rules that make it fast, and even learn how to spot where it doesn't work at all. Okay, so we can't calculate slope at one point, but we could find slope from two points that are incredibly close together. We need to think about any line that crosses the graph at two distinct points as a secant line, and the line that intersects the graph at exactly one point as a tangent line. So think about this secant line here crossing through these two points in yellow. If we start bringing this second point closer to the first, eventually we'll end up with two points that are very close together, and we could see how the slope between these two points is gonna do a better job estimating the slope at this leftmost point than the two points that we started with. And that's because this point here is much closer to the leftmost point than this rightmost point. The idea here is that when we find the slope of a secant line, what we're finding is average rate of change between the two points that are defining that secant line. But when we move to the tangent line, where we're finding slope at one point, we're moving to instantaneous rate of change, or the rate of change at this exact instant, this point of tangency, compared to rate of change between two distinct points. What we're seeing here is that as we move this second point closer and closer to the first point, we get a better estimation of rate of change. So the idea of the derivative is that we're moving those two distinct points from the secant line infinitely close together until that distance between the two points goes to zero, and instead of a secant line, we get a tangent line that allows us to find the slope at an exact instant. That process moves us from average to instantaneous rate of change, it moves us from the secant line to the tangent line, which is gonna give us the derivative, and it moves us from slope over an interval to slope at one specific point. So we have this general concept of the derivative, but how do we even express the derivative of a function? Well, it's important to say that all of this notation is acceptable for expressing the derivative. Normally we'll see f prime of x or dy dx to represent the derivative, but sometimes we'll also see y prime if our function is expressed to us as y equals and then some function in terms of x. All of these mean the derivative of f with respect to x or the derivative of the function f with respect to the variable x. What we're indicating here with any of this notation is the slope or rate of change of the function f of the curve at any particular point x in its domain. No matter what notation we use, this is the formal definition of the derivative. It looks complicated, but it really isn't if we break it down. So what does this actually mean? Well, let's look at the numerator here. If we choose h to be some small distance, then this numerator here is giving us the change in y between the value of the function at x and the value of the function at x plus this extra little distance here. So we really have two points and we're getting here the change in y. The denominator is giving us the change in x because h is that little distance that we've defined, which means this fraction is giving us slope, change in y over change in x or rise over run. What we're saying is that we're taking the limit as h goes to zero, so we're letting that distance between the two points shrink to zero as that secant line turns into a tangent line. And this is our derivative notation we just saw. So this is how we're formally defining the derivative. If we wanna see this formula in action, let's say we have the function f of x equals x squared and we wanna find its derivative. Well, we just say the derivative f prime of x is gonna be equal to, and then all we have to do is plug x plus h into our function Doing that gives us x plus h quantity squared. We see that here. Then we plug in f of x, which we know is x squared. So we plug that in here. Those are the only two things we need to put into our formula. The rest of the work is algebra. So we expand our x plus h quantity squared to x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Then we see that we can cancel x squared and negative x squared, leaving us with this fraction here. We can factor an h out of the numerator, and then we can cancel that common factor of h from the numerator and denominator, leaving us with just 2x plus h. Now here's where we apply the limit because we've simplified the expression 2x plus h as much as we can. So it's time to plug in h equals zero since we're taking the limit as h gets close to zero. Plugging in h equals zero gives us 2x plus zero or just 2x. And so we can say 
that the derivative of this function f of x equals x squared is f prime of x equal to 2x. 2x is the derivative of x squared. Here's the issue though, doing this algebra is powerful. It does allow us to find the derivative and it will work every time, but it's way too slow. So now we need to learn some shortcuts. The first of which is the power rule for derivatives. It's gonna let us quickly differentiate power functions instead of using that clunky, tedious definition of the derivative. So for instance, if we have this polynomial function that includes these power functions, three x to the four and five x squared, this derivative rule tells us that when we have x to the n, we simply multiply n by the coefficient, we bring that down in front, and then we subtract one from the exponent. That means that the derivative of three x to the four is three times four, x to the four minus one, and in the same way, the derivative of five x squared is five times two times x to the two minus one. We're bringing that exponent down in front and we're subtracting one from the exponent. The derivative of a constant is always zero. So when we simplify this, we get 12x cubed minus 10x. That's the derivative of this original function f. The toughest part of power rule is recognizing that we do in fact have a power function even when it may not look like it. For instance here, let's say we're given this function g, four over x cubed. It doesn't necessarily look like an x to the n function, but if we use exponent rules to rewrite this as four x to the negative three, then we can apply power rule just like we did in this example. Having a negative exponent doesn't change anything about our power rule. We simply bring that negative exponent down in front and subtract one from the exponent. So the derivative there is negative 12 x to the negative four. We also need to recognize power rule when we see roots in our function. So this is six times the cube root of x. Doesn't look like an x to the n function, but we can rewrite this. Six times the cube root of x is the same as six x to the one third. Now we've got a power function because in the same way that a negative exponent didn't change our application of power rule, a fractional exponent also won't change the application of power rule. So the derivative here, that one third comes down in front, we subtract one from the exponent, and the derivative is six times one third, or two, x to the one third minus one, or negative two thirds. Two x to the negative two thirds is the derivative there of six times the cube root of x. Three more absolutely critical rules here before we look at how to apply them in more challenging situations. The product rule tells us that when we have the product of two functions f and g, the derivative is f prime times g plus f times g prime. In other words, take the derivative of one function at a time, leaving the other one alone, and sum those products. For example, if we have this equation, y equals quantity x squared plus one times sine x, we can think of f as x squared plus one and g as sine of x. We have two separate functions multiplied together. So when we take the derivative, we take the derivative of x squared plus one first, which is two x, because the derivative of x squared is two x, and the derivative of one is zero. So we get two x plus zero, or just two x. And then we leave the sine of x function completely alone. Then we add to that the opposite situation, this time where we leave x squared plus one alone, and we differentiate sine of x. So we leave x squared plus one, don't touch it, and then the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. So there's our derivative. Keep in mind here that we're looking at rules for derivatives, but in other videos, I do cover the derivatives of all six trig functions. This is how we know that the derivative of sine of x is always cosine of x. And I also cover the derivatives of exponential and logarithmic functions, all of which we'll see consistently in functions that we need to differentiate. The quotient rule tells us that when we want to take the derivative of a quotient, f over g, we take the derivative of the numerator, multiply it by the denominator, untouched, then subtract the numerator, untouched, multiply by the derivative of the denominator, we divide that whole thing by the square of the denominator. So if we have some function like x squared plus 1 divided by x plus 3, when we take the derivative, we find the derivative of the numerator, so the derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x, then we multiply that by the denominator. We leave it alone, we don't do anything. Then we subtract the opposite scenario. This time, we leave the numerator alone. x squared plus one is just our numerator. And then we multiply by the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of x is one. The derivative of three is zero. So one plus zero, or just one. And then we divide that by the square of that denominator. We can simplify this 
a little bit by multiplying the 2x across the x plus 3 and simplifying this minus quantity x squared plus 1. And then we see here in our numerator that 2x squared minus x squared is going to simplify to just 1x squared. And so we get our derivative of this original equation y. The last of our four super important rules is chain rule. This is how we differentiate composite functions where we have g of x inside of f of x. So when we have a function f of g, the derivative is going to be the derivative of the outside function f, leaving g completely alone, leaving it untouched, then multiplying by the derivative of the inside function. So we take the derivative of the outside function, then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So let's see that in action. If we have y equals cosine of 5x squared, cosine is our outside function. 5x squared is our inside function. So when we differentiate, we're going to take the derivative of the outside function, cosine, whose derivative is negative sine. So we get negative sine, and then we leave the inside function completely alone. We don't touch it. Just leave it as 5x squared. But then chain rule tells us that we have to multiply by the derivative of 5x squared, which is 10x. So we multiply this by 10x, and then all we have to do is simplify by bringing the 10x in front. So we have negative from this negative sign, 10x times sine of 5x squared, that's our derivative. We always have to be careful to apply chain rule whenever we're differentiating. So we have these four rules, power, product, quotient, and chain rule. And obviously they're super helpful when we have the equation of the function. But what if we don't actually have the function's equation? What if we only have its graph? How are we supposed to estimate the value of a derivative with the graph only? Well, let's say that we have this graph here. And we've been told that we have a tangent line intersecting the graph at this point of tangency here in the middle. We have to be told this is a tangent line. We can't just visually estimate and assume that it only intersects the graph at one point. We need to know specifically that this is defined as a tangent line. If it is, then we can estimate the derivative at that point of tangency by finding two other points on the tangent line, one on either side of the tangent point, and use those to estimate the derivative at the point of tangency. So the slope at that tangent point can be given still by rise over run, or the change in y over the change in x. And using these other two points, our change in y is 3 minus 1. Our change in x is 6 minus 2. And that's, of course, going to give us 2 over 4, or simplified, 1 half. So if we know that the tangent line passes through 2, 1, and 6, 3, we can use those two points, one on either side of the tangent point, to estimate that the slope of this curve in red at this point is about 1 half. We can do the same thing from a table. Sometimes we're only given a table of values, not the graph, not the equation of the function. And in this situation, we'll do the same thing we did with the graph, where we use points on either side of the point we're interested in. So let's say we want to estimate the derivative at x equals 4. The derivative is not the function's value, 18. This tells us here that on the curve when x is 4, the function has a height of 18, or the curve, the graph, is passing through the point for 18. That still doesn't tell us anything about slope. What we have to do is take change in y over change in x. So the difference between x values at points on either side of 418 is 6 minus 2, and the change in y values is going to be 30 minus 10. And when we simplify, we get 4 over 20, or 1 fifth. So while the curve, while the graph, passes through the point 418, the slope, or the derivative, at x equals 4 is about 1 fifth. That's our estimation using a table of values. The last thing we need to do is look at three situations where the derivative fails, where we can't find the derivative at all, and then we'll look at a challenge problem. So we're not going to be able to find the derivative at a corner in the graph. This is the graph of the absolute value of x. And if we're asked to find the slope, or the derivative, at x equals 0, right at this corner, the problem is that the slope at this point coming in from the left side is a slope of negative 1, or a derivative of negative 1. Coming in from the right side, the slope is, or the derivative is, positive 1. When those two different slopes meet at this harsh corner, we can't say that the slope at x equals 0 is negative 1 or positive 1. There's a corner there, and the derivative is undefined. So when the left and right-hand slopes don't match at an exact point, 
the derivative is undefined there. We also have a problem when we have a discontinuity. This is the graph of the function one over x, and we can see that it has a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Because the function is discontinuous at x equals zero, we cannot find its derivative at exactly x equals zero. Anywhere else in the domain for any other x values, we'd be able to define a derivative, but not at x equals zero because there's a discontinuity. And then finally, for a graph like this one, it's continuous and there's no corner. The problem is that the tangent line is completely vertical at x equals zero, and we can't define the derivative at a vertical tangent line. Remember that slope is given by change in y over change in x. And for a curve like this one, at x equals zero, that change in x is zero. It's like we're dividing by zero or like we're putting zero in the denominator and a fraction with a zero denominator is always undefined. So the slope is undefined and the derivative is undefined. If we have a perfectly vertical tangent line like we do here at exactly the point x equals zero, we can't define the derivative at x equals zero even though we can define it everywhere else. So now that we understand the idea of the derivative and exactly how it's defined and the rules that we use to find derivatives, let's do this challenge problem. We have this quotient x squared divided by 2x plus 1 quantity cubed. How are we going to find the derivative? Well, we need to realize right off the bat that we're going to use quotient rule because, of course, this is a quotient. So we're going to start with quotient rule as our major idea. Remember when we apply quotient rule that we first take the derivative of the numerator. The derivative of x squared is 2x, so we start there. Then we're going to multiply that by the denominator, leaving the denominator completely untouched. We will subtract from that the numerator left untouched, so our original numerator. But now we multiply by the derivative of the denominator. Here's where things start to get tricky. Looking at our denominator, we're going to need to apply power rule with chain rule. So we have this base raised to the third power. So we're going to bring that exponent down in front and we're going to get 3 times quantity 2x plus 1, and then we're going to subtract 1 from the exponent. So 3 times 2x plus 1 quantity squared, because 3 minus 1 gives us a new exponent of 2. Now we have to multiply by the derivative of 2x plus 1, because that's the inside function. So 2x plus 1 differentiated gives us just 2 plus 0, or 2, so we have to multiply by 2. In other words, we know we're applying quotient rule, but inside of quotient rule, we've also had to apply power rule and chain rule as we go. So we're always going to be using these derivative rules together. Then going back to quotient rule, we divide by the square of the original denominator. Now all that's left to do is simplify the algebra. Here in this second term in the numerator, we take the 3 and the 2 multiplied together to get 6. We leave the x squared out in front, so minus 6x squared times 2x plus 1 quantity squared. And in the denominator, we're cubing 2x plus 1 and then squaring that. So we take 3 times 2 to get 6 for the new exponent. Now all that's left to do is cancel common factors of 2x plus 1. Here we had 3 factors of 2x plus 1, 2 factors of 2x plus 1, and 6 factors of 2x plus 1. So because we have 3, 2, and 6, the most we can cancel is 2. So we'll cancel 2x plus 1 quantity squared completely. Here, 2x plus 1 quantity cubed, when we cancel two of the three factors, is going to leave us with one factor. And in the denominator, canceling two of the six factors is going to leave us with four factors. Now from the numerator, we can factor out a 2x. When we do, that's going to leave us with 2x plus 1. And then pulling 2x out of minus 6x squared leaves us with a minus 3x. Then 2x minus 3x is a negative x. So inside the brackets here, we'll get 1 minus x. And then this is the final form of our derivative of our original function, f. So if you'd like more help with everything about derivatives, or if you want to go deeper and look more at trigonometric, exponential, and other derivatives, or practice more of these kinds of challenge problems, definitely check out my Calculus 1 course down below.